Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Unbox Live. I am your other host, Nate Beck, and this is my good friend, back for another round of cigars and cocktails, Charles Awad. Welcome, Charles. Howdy. Oh, we, we are going to have some fun today. We are doing sort of a redux of our uh, round one, where we are trying to pair uh, and drink some spirits that aren't typically given the limelight when it comes to pairing cigars and spirits. We all know about whiskey, scotch, rum, of course, is classic. Brown liquors. Brown liquors. Mm -hmm. um, last time we did mezcal, like a nice kind of floral, smoky mezcal. Yes. We did the whiskey cocoa. Yep. Uh, which is basically coconut water and Johnny Walker Red, like yep. cheap blended some whiskey, scotch. some scotch. 50, yep. 50. Yep. And then we did uh, the Pedro Jimenez Sherry. Yes, Sherry. Really oxidized. I'm kind of excited about what we have today. So we yep. are going to do two drinks today paired with, Matt, let's see if we can get a close up here. We are throwing it back old school with the Ashton Classic. And this is the 898 size. Charles's brother, JP, uh, I now have the pleasure of getting to work with him here at Boveda. Uh, he came on board here recently, so we were out visiting an account, and he pulled out one of these Ashton Classics from the Humidor, and I'm like, man, this smells really good. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, when's the last time you had one? Oh, my gosh. I think the last time legitimately that I've just had an Ashton Classic, yeah. it's been 20 years. Sure. For sure. Probably similar range for me. I think. I'm asking anything. I just remarked before we started recording. It's been a couple of years. For me yeah. I don't smoke. A lot I've, I had just the other day, I had an Ashton VSG that had some age on it. Sure. It's a great. Spectacular cigar. cigar. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember who I, I was. The last one I had was their anniversary that came out. Yeah. About two years ago. Sure. Yeah. I was talking to a cigar rep uh, the other day who said that the Ashton VSG would be his Desert Island cigar. Like, it's a great cigar. Just loves that cigar. Uh, but I, in pairing what we're going to be drink, in pairing cigar with what we're drinking today, I wanted to skew on the cigar something that was a little more subtle. Like this cigar has lots of nuts, uh, almond. I even get a little bit of cinnamon. Uh, definitely some cedar and kind of that grassy hay quality. Some cashew. Like cashew some lighter, for sure lighter nut quality yep. to it yeah uh, i'm kind of hoping that the drinks that we're doing which are uh maybe a little more assertive but uh a lot of botanicals clean profile yeah might actually help bring some unique things out in this uh ashton 898 so yes. let us know in the comments what you all are smoking uh if you can get off work or you're allowed to right. mix yourself up something delicious grab your favorite drink and uh and join us you'll, you'll notice we waited till exactly noon on friday to drink some alcohol exactly noon on the dot <laughs> <laughs> so what we are going to be drinking is we are going to be drinking the classic martini so we've got the classic gin martini and I like drinking them in low ball glasses because I personally cannot stand drinking a martini from a classic martini glass. Uh, it just always seems like I spill it. I lose some. It's also a massive pour. Like it's a, they're usually big glasses. Yeah. Uh, or your guest host forgets to bring coops. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes that all We were going to maybe do coop <laughs> glasses, which yeah, also were great like for a coupe, martini. But, but if you're, if you're heavy handed. You know, I batch martinis in my fridge. Yeah. I'll get a low ball glass. The next thing I know, the bottle's empty and I'm on the floor. Uh-huh. <laughs> Wait a Wait, second. Wait, what <laughs> happened? The coop helps to restrain you a little bit. <laughs> Portions, portion control. Uh, so first drink we're going to talk about is the gin martini. And then the second drink is going to be uh, sweet vermouth. Uh, both Charles and his brother JP have been on trips uh Charles had his honeymoon. You had your honeymoon Spain. in Spain. Yeah. Uh, JP and his wife took a trip to Spain and both remarked on the abundance of sipping Sipping vermouths vermouth. yes. that are everywhere in Spain. And yeah. here in the United States, you really don't find that. You typically go to a liquor store and you get Dolan or right. what, Gallo? Um, sure. What is it? Your Noi standard mixers. We yeah. had a lot of mixing. Noe Pratt vermouth. or Noe Pratt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Kind of the standard red or dry vermouths. Yes. And we have two more interesting vermouths here uh, that we're going to talk about. Uh, so if you have a good liquor store that's stocking some of these vermouths, I got these from a local shop here in Minnesota called France 44, and they have a robust selection of 
uh, suite and dry vermouth, as well as an entire row yes. dedicated to Amaro's, which I was very excited about. Yeah, another shop locally that has some higher level sipping vermouths is Henry and Sons. Mm, yeah. So it's you're starting to see the category expand in the U.S., particularly major markets, because people are beginning to have an interest in yeah. sipping vermouths. Yep. Which classically in Spain, what you would get is vermouth on the rocks with a slice of orange like a whole slice of orange mm -hmm. not the peel and a uh, green olive and i recently saw someone post a uh, meme on on instagram or facebook i can't recall which that said how much would someone have to pay you to drink this because whoever made the meme thought it was a joke drink mm -hmm. and people were remarking that's disgusting and i would never drink that and i had to remark that that's actually very common in spain so mm -hmm. It's nothing unusual about that. You just don't understand it quite yet. You don't get it. You know, because you're adding to, to that you. sweetness. You're at the the olive adds a little bit of salinity, mm -hmm. so it kind of balances out that sweet drink. Um, it's that combination, I think, that people find a little pretty. Yeah. And I almost kind of think, you know, adding that orange to uh, a sweet red vermouth, especially one like this with kind of their description on this company's website, mm -hmm. you've got dense kind of dark fruit sweeter uh sherries that make up there are two different sherries that make up this vermouth and then they add botanicals it's kind of like making a you know like a mulled wine or something you add that bit of citrus mm -hmm. into well, it and it's like bright sweet citrus as opposed to yeah. you know if you add lemon yeah. or lime you have either redundancy or you're bringing you're bringing the acidity up if you already have acidity present so it's nice to have if you want a little bit of the orange you can take a bite out of it you can muddle it in a little bit yep uh, and then if you want to offset that sweetness you eat the olive Nice little drink. Yep. Today, I think we're just going to sip that uh, this red vermouth, their sweet vermouth. We're just going to sip it neat, kind of get a, you know, sort of the purest uh, form of it. We have some ice that we could throw in there as well, but uh, we'll see what we think when we sip it here. Uh, just neat. But first, let's talk about the uh, gin martini. So I think, Charles, you're probably a bigger fan of gin martinis than you are vodka martinis for the most part. No. I know you like both or do you like vodka better? Depends on... You know, different different tools for for different uh, occasions. But sure. My favorite martini would be a really dirty vodka martini. Wow. Um, I have some friends who frown upon the fact that I use vodka, but I like a really dirty, really savory vodka martini. But I also like a Vesper uh, with gin. I like uh, a Gibson also with vodka. But you can you can also intersperse if you want the botanical qualities of gin. You can use the gin in your dirty martini you can use it in your gibson sure so martini classic martini mm -hmm. anywhere from two to four parts gin generally yeah to one dry. part vermouth mm -hmm. um i tend to like heavier vermouth because i like that botanical quality i like that added roundness it brings to it so the what we're going to drink today we did two to one the other nice thing about having a good vermouth is that you don't mind tasting it quite as much correct if you're getting bad vermouth that you dry store already opened and you just want to make yourself uh, a, a martini and you have, you know, your martini and Rossi that's a year old with fruit flies floating around it. Maybe go light on the vermouth because it's not going to taste very good. <laughs> Especially if it's been, it's dusty, you know, it's yeah. got that little haze. Dusty on the and bottle. crusty. Oh yeah. In you the know, back you of your, can't you know. even get the top off. because It's a little crusty <laughs> around the rim. Exactly. How old is this again? Yeah. Right. So uh, we did this vermouth, um, the Alessio dry vermouth. Um, that was recommended to add a little, uh, a little less dryness, but kind of some rounder botanicals, uh, in that dry white vermouth. Uh, so I'm excited to try that in this martini. Uh, this one we used classic Tanqueray. That is my favorite go-to gin. It's Dang. readily available. Uh, <laughs> I happen to have this, you know, handle at home cause they had a nice coupon at total wine. So it's about, I like to support local liquor stores, but when it comes to stuff like, you know, that you drink every day, gin and tonics, those kind of drinks, um, perfectly okay to get it at a place like Total Wine. Your preferences will vary if you like, yeah. you know, London Dry. I like, I like Bombay. Uh, I like to use the Bombay Dry label. Yep. For a Classico martini like this, gin martini. It's got a lot of the qualities that I look for, but your mileage will vary. There's a lot of great local gins, not just in our market, but whatever market you may yeah. reside in. Lots of great, super clean uh, gins that you can get off your store shelves. Yep. So we did two parts Tanqueray to one part uh, dry vermouth. And then we did a couple dashes each. We batched uh, the two drinks in one shaker over ice. And then we did a couple dashes uh, 
uh, of orange Angostura orange bitters, which is traditional yes. in uh, a gin martini, right, Charles? Yeah, the original martini recipe was what you're looking at in front of you here, and it contains orange bitters. And I think a lot of people had forgotten that step. But if you have uh, bartender friends, they'll be quick to remark to you that this is how a martini is actually made. Um, my friend Blue Jay Ballard basically will swat any other martini out of your hand if you you try telling him it's the best martini and he'll make you one of these. Mm -hmm. So circling back to this cigar, are you tasting anything different? Uh, we're maybe what? inch in on our cigars about now thereabouts just really clean like yeah construction is fantastic it's it's tight but the draw is super easy um i'm really enjoying it's this it's really clean really straightforward lots of it, it's it has some complexity of various like nutty qualities but it's very nuanced yeah it's, yeah this is a really easy smoking if you're gonna start drinking at noon on friday like we are start with one of these absolutely and interesting thing about Tanqueray, before we sip this, um, Tanqueray was the original gin used in uh, a Negroni. Is that so? Yep. I didn't. Yeah, um, I guess I would. That know. was the first gin. Yeah. I would have had to guess if you said right? what gin was right? originally used in Negroni is I would. Yeah. You again, kind of like we're starting to see more options in vermouth, especially mm -hmm. more options in unique Amaros. Sure. There are uh, just myriad gins that are all over the map as far as botanicals right um profile i happen to like that punch in the teeth of juniper that you get with tanqueray yes i just love that um that's one of the my things favorite. That in terms of the certification of your gins if it's london it has to have a much higher quantity um by percentage of juniper mm -hmm. in the botanical bill than an american gin that doesn't purport to be a london gin you can they can use like a much vaster variety by percentage of various botanicals. So as a general rule, if you don't want to sit on your phone and Google what's in each bottle you're staring at, if you see London, it's going to be junipery. If you don't see London, it's probably going to be less junipery than the one that says London. That's a great tip. Yeah, because sometimes when you're staring at a wall of liquor, especially mm -hmm. when you're in somewhere like Total Wine or a, a, a Binnie's or right. Specs, you know, these larger liquor stores, uh, it can be overwhelming, you know, to know what you're looking at, but that's uh that's an excellent tip. Let's see if they have that here on. Yeah. Right. At the bottom London dry gin. Yep. So just higher, very, very prominent down here at the bottom. Of... Uh, yes. All right. Should we take a sip? Yeah. Charles. Hey, cheers. Okay. Happy Friday. Indeed. Yeah. We went with an extra dash of orange. Typically what you're yeah. doing is a dash of the orange bitters per cocktail. Clean. Nate shook up a double. We went with a third uh, third shake of the orange bitter. Yep. It's, I, I like it being present. You know, mm -hmm. your mileage will vary if you really like that bit of orange quality and the slight bit of bitterness that is um, imparted to the beverage via that, then, you know, give yourself an extra shake. We typically, Nate and I both go really heavy handed on bitters and, yeah, and we drink the calls for it. Yep. I think we might have to do at some point uh, a round three uh -oh. of fill this show and bring in an, a drink we affectionately call the Naughty Philip, and then maybe do some Amaros <laughs> as well. So first off, I want to say, uh, uh, Matt, if you can pop that comment up, I'm hoping this is our good friend, Big I John Nelson. Uh, if it is, cheers right back at you, my friend. Thanks for joining in. Uh, another gin drink, uh, that I am, we are both very fond of mm -hmm. my general day-to-day -day drink of choice year round is Tanqueray and Tonic. I really like the fever tree brand and their elderflower flavor. I really like it's easy. You open the bottle, you put in a couple ounces of gin, give it a little mm -hmm. swirl. You're done. I make, I, got my own, I make my own tonic syrup, so I go, oh, Charles I go makes next level. killer tonic syrup. Yeah. My wife's favorite beverage is also the gin and tonic, mm -hmm. and every year for her birthday, I make her this comical sum of uh, this proprietary tonic syrup that I make, and then she gets a soda stream, mixes two tablespoons of the syrup with uh, fresh soda water, get some lime, get some good gin, and away you go. Yep. Doesn't last her long either. And I make her a lot of it. So yeah, yeah a lot. <laughs> yeah. And you've kind of nailed the, yeah. the filtering process. Uh, 
So we drink gin and tonics and I was bored one day and thought, oh, let's do a little dive down Google and see if you can find some like easy riffs on a gin and tonic. Sure. So I stumble upon this article in Esquire magazine and maybe second or third cocktail down is a drink that they affectionately called the pretty Tony. That's right. And it was <laughs> basic gin and tonic. So like one and a half to two ounces of gin, four ounces of tonic, uh, you know, kind of a two to one ratio. And then 10 to 12 dashes of Angostura bitters, like regular. And when I make this drink, I, I tend to put in enough to make it basically turn the color red of this label. <laughs> like, I want it like red-orange. Like a rich, yeah, blood-orange. Like blood-orange color. color. Yeah. You know, I like those Angostura bitters. I think it's delicious. So... A few weeks after I tell Charles about the pretty Tony, he texts me and says, what the heck is the name of that drink? No, we were sitting on my patio. Was that where it was? Yeah, because <laughs> we were, we just kept trying to figure, we couldn't think of, well, I couldn't think of the specific name. I'd heard of the drink before. Yep. I don't remember if I'd had one at that point, but I know you were like really hot on it and we're like, let's make some. And yeah, I said, what, uh, what's, what's, what's it called? called? Uh, Naughty, Naughty Philip? Philip. And I said, well, it is now. <laughs> yeah. So now that's we call way it Naughty Philip. So I've actually tried to convince been, people that's the real name. It is. So spread and the word. I go to bars all the time now. And when they're pouring in the Angostura, I said, keep going. Yep. Keep going. Keep shaking. Because some some bitters bottles will pour out really heavy and some pour yeah. out like little. So right. depends on how, how your bottle pours. It could be 10. It could be, you know, 12 for each uh, glug of alcohol. That's why when a recipe with bitters says a shake of bitters, it's, it's more to taste than it is what you're yep. looking at. You can't tell how much is coming out of that thing. Mm hmm. So that's become one of our favorite drinks. We'll have to do that mm -hmm. one in a, on maybe a version three or a round three. Uh, what do you think of the martini? Tastes good? Excellent. Right? Yeah. And then as ever on our last episode, um, either if you did not tune in or if you'd like a, a refresher, um, as ever, what, you're, what you want to do is you want to taste these things alternatingly. So you want to taste the cigar, then taste the drink, mm -hmm. then taste the cigar because they each impart different flavors to one another. It, it isn't just one affecting the other. They're both affecting the flavors that you're experiencing on each end of the equation. So just took a sip of the martini, mm -hmm. just took a puff, and the nuts really came, like the nuttiness really came to the forefront for me. Like lots of cashew. Yeah. It almost brings a little bit of sweetness out in because you you have the residual sweetness in your mouth from effectively just the orange. Yep. And the orange and the the nuttiness, it's like a marzipan sort of effect. That I love between the two. Marzipan, when when it comes to flavors in cigars, marzipan is one I use all the time mm -hmm. because it's nutty and it's sweet without, you know pinpointing is it almonds is it cashews is it peanuts is it walnuts you know whatever the nut is it's that paste that has that yep. like nougat in a candy bar it kind of you know this nice round flavor it's yes. a great descriptor for uh cigars uh matt do we have the ashton site that we could pull up i think on their site one of the flavor notes that they call out uh and i didn't want to bring out too many you mm -hmm. know until we kind of gotten into the cigar sure. one of the flavor notes is uh coffee bean and I actually kind of get a little mm -hmm. bit of like, uh, not brewed coffee, but like the cigar tastes like coffee bean smell when you open up the bag. Sure, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can get that a little bit. You almost, I am also getting like a little bit of like milk chocolate. Sure, and you know, and they're tasting those. They've got cream, coffee bean, almond, mm -hmm. cashew, cedar. So for sure, marzipan sure. is right in there. Yep. And I think chocolatey notes come in there as well. It's um, like a light chocolate. That's why I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm referring specifically to milk chocolate. And yep. I think the, the yep. beverage is also affecting those dynamics as well. Yep. Uh, something else to consider if you're going to pair maybe a richer cigar or something that does have more deliberate chocolate notes is orange bitters, chocolate. Not everybody loves that combination, but I quite like it. So if you had like a, a little bit of a richer cigar that had more of those like coffee or chocolate undertones, yeah. coffee and orange is beautiful together. Chocolate and orange is beautiful together. Absolutely. Especially if you get like dark chocolate mm -hmm. and the orange notes, maybe go a little heavier with the bitters. It goes to show that you don't necessarily have to, you can use contrast to create pairings with your cigars. It doesn't have to be same, same. 
you don't have to make things align. You can sometimes use the dynamics of contrast and, to, to create new flavors. And honestly, that's what I was hoping to accomplish with this cigar mm -hmm. and what we're drinking is something that's really, you know, it's contrasting. Um, I almost get, when I take a sip of this uh, gin martini, this particular dry vermouth, as I like, as it hits the back of my tongue, my brain expects that there's going to be this wash of sweetness because there's a, sure. uh, a little more fruit flavor in there mm -hmm. that I'm getting. Right. But then as soon as you swallow the drink, it's a little more of a hit of bitterness and it isn't actually sweetness. So it's kind right. of a cool surprise. Yeah. I, I love that sort of psych out in beverages because yeah. I love cocktails of all types, but I don't have much of a sweet tooth. So when I drink cocktails, often if I go out for an evening to a new cocktail bar and you're trying their bevy of cocktails, it's mostly going to be sweet leaning. There's yeah. simple syrups and, and various uh, s confections and things being used to affect certain flavors. By the end of the evening, when I've had, you know, four to six cocktails trying the menu out, I just mm -hmm. give me, give me a spirit, give me something to sip on, give me some mezcal, something smoky, something that doesn't have mm -hmm. any sweetness on the finish. But that's a nice thing about a beverage like this. If you're like me, a beverage like this, it's, it's almost like you, you feel like you're about to get hit with some sweetness, but you don't. So you get the fruit quality, but mm -hmm. it stops short of, of having that like slick, on I your dig tongue it, that you weren't necessarily looking for. Yeah, I dig it. Um, Matt, can you throw up Steve's comment? Uh, because I almost bought this. Uh, Steve says, Our yeah, I'm great. guessing our favorite gin is the botanist, yes, made in Isla by Brooklotti. Makes a beautiful classic. Martini. It's delicious, and I almost bought it, but I had Tanqueray, and I thought, well, sure. let's stick with that. It's simple, it's classic. Um it's for sure that London dry gin, but the botanist has, mm -hmm. that has an amazing flavor profile. If you were going to go to the store, I, the, my recommendation was to get the Bombay dry because I thought there was a higher probability that you would find that. Not that it's for sure to find the botanist, yep. but just knowing if you were hitting the corner store, yep. then that's something you need to consider as well when you're thinking about what you want to use in your uh, because martini. Because while these things are really cool, mm -hmm. you're going to have to go to a liquor store that sure. really generally is going to be a very good wine store um and they're going to have more of this right um because they skew to you know maybe natural wines maybe uh pet nat wines right um small producers they're going to have this type of variety but you know when you go when i was at total wine the other day they don't have any of this they have your dolan dry vermouth they have your uh martini and rossi your gallo you know kind of the basics they do have the uh one of the really good vermouths is the antica classico also, the Koki. Yeah, um, is great. Uh, the Koki um, makes some really good vermouths, but I want to do something really unique. So mm -hmm. it was nice to have the resource here locally that has uh, some of this more obscure spirit, at least right. for the time being. And the Koki's pulling some sweetness as well. They have, there's more to them. Yeah. Than, yeah. To some of their parts. Yeah. I'm really enjoying this, uh, this pairing. I've always liked. Uh, I guess you could say off kilter or less common pairings with things because sure. my brain is very curious and part of what we're seeking to accomplish with these exercises when we've, you know, this is our second session and we are yeah. not doing traditional pairings because mm -hmm. as we mentioned last time, you know how to pour yourself some brown and, and mm -hmm. light a cigar. Everyone does that. That's basically the, uh, the second nature, Yeah, you know, pour myself a little bit of scotch or a, an American bourbon or something like that and light yourself a cigar. That's uh that's old hat. But what it we're is. seeking to accomplish is to impart the knowledge that you can pair practically anything, mm -hmm. practically anything. Yep. I mean, you can, I know there, there are accompaniments to cigars and there are pairings to cigars. If you're drinking a Pilsner or a lager, American lager with your cigar, I call that an accompaniment. It's not a pairing, but it can work well together if you're not smoking your cigar so hard that you're burning out your palate mm -hmm. if you know how to properly smoke a cigar you can still enjoy that lager mm -hmm. but that goes to show that you can pair practically anything with a cigar if you're seeking to make an actual pairing if you want those two things to uh complement and accentuate one another because yeah. that's what a pairing is you're the complementing or accentuating one another they're not just i enjoy this and i enjoy this it's what are they doing to become greater than the sum of their parts yeah how are they lifting one another up yeah um yeah, let's put up Daniel's comment. Uh, howdy, guys. Just getting into cigars. Uh, good for you, man. Uh, welcome to the club. Uh, I'm a huge scotch drinker, as am I. So I'm looking forward to hearing what else I can pair with cigars. Uh, 
or what else I can pair cigars with. Um, you know, we're doing the martini. Next is going to be sweet vermouth. Uh, I think smoky mezcal is one of the, like a delicious, yeah. Uh, compliment to cigars. Adjacent, I love that. You know, that's scotch adjacent because if for you sure. like the, the smoky quality of your scotches. Yep. The thing is, if you want to refer back to our prior episode, if you uh, hadn't seen it previously, we made whiskey cocoa. So that's something that is, will be, it'll be an entirely new pairing for you if you haven't tried it before, but it's, it's scotch, but it's scotch and coconut water. Yeah. And so you're adding like a little bit of natural sweetness and nuttiness so that's that's it's a way to like take so another good. step if you don't want to step too far away from what you already enjoy go in that direction and then of mm -hmm. course um aged and fortified wines because mm -hmm. those have the oxidation has similar like smoky qualities so if you're looking at taking mm -hmm. steps into an entirely new direction that's somewhere where i would ask you to maybe explore next yeah and age champagnes but you know that's gonna if you're experimenting that's very expensive yes <laughs> and i had a really nice pairing speaking of off the beaten path uh I had my favorite rosé, uh, really crisp, high minerality, um, subtle mm. strawberry berry notes, uh, a wine from Provence. Uh, uh, everyone affectionately calls it Barjamon, but it's uh, Commandery de la Barjamon. Uh, and I had that with the Fiat Lux, which is made oh. by Luciano Cigars, or now Luciano Cigars. And that cigar has some natural acidity to it in that blend. And that wine and that cigar were spectacular together. Yeah, like, I loved that. That's certainly something to consider as well. That's an element that I think maybe gets lost when people think about pairing. And again, you can use it as contrast or you can mm -hmm. use it as a complement. Yep. You can use the acid to offset something that's rich or you can make those things interplay because it brings out more acidity in something that has like a, a medium to a, yeah. a nuanced type of acidity to it. All right. Shall we move on to sure. beverage number two? Yeah. All right. So let's... Open up this bottle. The Vermouth Lustau. Vermouth Lustau. So Lustau is the producer. Uh, of course, Vermouth. And then this is the Rojo. So the classic red Vermouth. All right. I know your eyes are not deceiving you. And it's not a, it's, it doesn't mean that the product is defective because red Vermouth looks like it's brown. That's it oxidation that yep. is occurring to the grapes. Yep. So that's normal. Mm -hmm. And often that's actually a good sign because it's a sign of a properly made. Matt, do we have the, the site for loose, uh, the loose style vermouth? Uh, this is a combination of two different sherry grape varietals, the uh, Amontillado and the Pedro Jimenez. Uh, on our first cocktail pairing video, we actually did Pedro Jimenez sherry. Yes. But the difference then in vermouth is they add botanicals to both of those wines um, to bring in earthy flavors maybe sometimes this has i'm hoping gentian, this has coriander, a little orange, gentian coriander peel. exactly yep. and you nailed it i mean gentian uh wormwood actually comes up mm -hmm. in the list of ingredients here um spices like baking spices yeah, uh coriander, orange peel and it's wormwood, very affordable gentian. i think yep. this bottle was 24 dollars. okay yeah. so for a sipping spirit for a sipping. that's vermouth too, like that yeah. it's mm -hmm. you know it's definitely less expensive than scotch uh definitely less expensive than mezcal for the most part yes um and it's something that you can have over the over ice you can have a decent pour and it's more like a glass of wine so it's not as high alcohol yeah and depending on your vocation if you're the type of person that is allowed to have a beverage over lunchtime this mm -hmm. is 15 percent. whereas you know the the martinis got a little more gas to it mm -hmm. Yeah, that martini, like once you mix it, what are we probably at 35% ABV? Thereabouts, yeah. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Averaging the notions All between right. the two. Yeah. Hey, cheers. Cheers. Oh, it smells really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's wonderful. And at that price point, mm. this is great. This is a that's a very very good vermouth for I say this that mid twenty price point, dude. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's all, like a, a bit of a tartness, yeah, to it. There's some naturally de derived salinity from a uh, vermouth that has the various botanicals in it and has been yeah. aged the way that it's been aged, due just to the aging process and the addition of those botanicals as well as the oxidation, which makes it natural 
to consider the application of having like an olive in there. Mm -hmm. it, it works really well. And then it obviously, you know, let's see what it does to um, our enjoyment of the cigar and, and how it impacts the flavor. Ooh, I definitely get more of that sweetness. Yeah, I agree. Up front. For sure, that marzipan mm -hmm. comes right to the forefront. Man, mm. I got to start smoking these again. This is really good. It's it's creating this really interesting interplay of like fig and walnut, like the fruit and nut combination that's common to pastries or like yeah, teen, like a, this Lebanese fig jam that you may or may not have ever had in your life. But yeah. the, the nuttiness and the fruitiness together yeah. are just it just works so well together. Mm. Yeah, there's like a, nice. a tartness or a acidity on the back of my tongue mm -hmm. on this. Like whether it's there or not, I kind of feel like the finish has a tiny bit of uh, smokiness, kind of like yes the, the the oxidation yeah you know. like almost like the most subtle hint of like a campfire mm -hmm. kind of you know a uh, little woodsy um right yeah like in their description on the actually it wasn't on the website for the uh Lustau, but on another uh website i was looking up some tasting reviews of this particular vermouth and i think this one was in forbes magazine of all places sure. but one of the tasting notes was great and tasting notes can get a little over the top but i kind of sure. i kind of dig it like i like the the nerding out about stuff you know mm -hmm. the uh that extra layer of cliff clavin knowledge uh that you can uh you know trot out when you're sitting at the bar or having cocktails with your buddies uh like forest floor was one of the tasting notes right and i was like you know and we hear and the more like, obscure ones yeah and like i think of forest floor i think forest of blanket in minnesota concrete. here when you go to northern minnesota you have <laughs> birch geez, birch and pine forest or spruce forest and it's a lot of those flavors being a scandinavian are flavors that i really really dig in food in cocktails uh in beverages so hearing that it actually makes me kind of really really interested because i like those flavors and another point that's important to make, take it from someone who's been a beer judge and a, and a cocktail judge, is no, no flavor notes that you are observing are incorrect. There's no such thing. As my friend Eric Eastman likes to say, it's your mouth. No one can tell you what you're tasting. So don't be obscured by what uh, tasting notes on Ashton's website or on Lou Stow's website are telling you you're supposed to be tasting in a cigar or in a beverage or what they do to one another. Yep which there are no notes for except until now, like, you know, Hey, the preeminent notes about pairing the Ashton with the loose style or moot. But if you taste something, call it out. It, the braver you are about what you're tasting, the better you're going to get at understanding flavor. Yeah. Just say what you're, say what you're experiencing. And in my experience as someone who has a lot of experience doing this type of thing, I don't like to obscure anyone's uh, vision when they're experiencing something for the first time. I don't like to call out if I'm with a friend who is maybe just beginning to explore the exercise of of trying new flavors or trying perhaps to sip on vermouth for the first time. I would never be the first one to call out something that I taste in it. I'd rather them feel around a little yeah. bit and make a determination of what it is that they're experiencing before I you know, either concur with them or I have like a contrasting view, but I would never say you're no, that's not there. Right. And anyone who does that to you, like, you know, push them well, up the, and push them out the patio door and slide it shut. Right. And if you throw out a flavor note or a component mm -hmm. that you think is there, mm -hmm. if that person is new to the experience of whatever it is you're drinking or smoking or eating, now they're probably going to feel like they taste that. Yeah. In that, in that, whatever it is that you're consuming. Or if, and or I like if you that. are experienced, someone can call something out and you're like, wow, that's, that's crazy. Um, yeah. Nate sat in for a little while on a recording of libations for everyone that we recorded last night and came out this morning. And at the end we had this uh, prickly pear, no, sorry, prickly ash rum that it's a lot like Szechuan peppercorn. And as we lifted it up to our noses before we tasted it, 
the smell is spellbinding and we were all landing on different characterizations of what we were smelling we got bubble gum laffy taffy and then like breakfast cereals and we arrived there like lucky charms kind of stuff yeah so my right? my co-host ben Quam said um this smells like uh i think he said fruity pebbles sure and then i said i smell tricks and then we were all like oh tricks tricks like we had to explore we had to come to that conclusion after cumulatively making a determination of what it was we were smelling and so tasting and that's tricks we're like oh my god it's this smells and tastes like tricks how bizarre that's is that? awesome which i think tricks is kind of a lemony sort of and fruit mm -hmm. are that way too right it's really only one flavor and every color is the same yes it's like that artificially sort of candy lemon yes yeah yes and man you mentioned those cereals and that immediately takes me back the only time I was allowed to have sugar cereal was on camping trips. <laughs> and when I was a kid, I'm 48 years old. When I was a kid, you used to be able to buy little square boxes of sugar cereal. Sure. And they came wrapped in a brick that was about, Matt, do you remember this? The single about serving. This tall. I remember Yeah. yeah I'm Charles remembers this. Remember about it. this tall. Yeah. And it had, what, maybe 24 boxes in it? Right. And it came with tricks. Cocoa an insulting puffs. serving size to any child. Oh, it's by the terrible. Way. Like and you're eight, supposed to be able to eat like, pieces of tricks. <laughs> pour the milk you. in. <laughs> <laughs> but they were all these cereals that had kind of all the same flavor. But it's 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 cool when you get that nostalgic memory because it takes you right back to a place in time when you were a kid. Sure. And you you remember exactly what that tasted like, what it smelled like. Absolutely. One of my favorite flavor descriptors. Uh, if you haven't watched any of the movies uh, about master sommeliers, they're called Psalm. They have a couple of them. I think it was in the first one, one of the individuals who was studying for their master sommelier uh, exam was drinking this wine and they tend to fire off flavor notes pretty fast. You know, mm -hmm. they're kind of, they're having to go through this stuff at a rapid clip. Yeah. And he said, and also they want to, they want to be quick to express what it is that they're experiencing yes. instead of second guessing it. On the same wine, fresh cut garden hose and a newly opened can of tennis balls. Right. Yeah. And it's <laughs> like, I remember exactly what new tennis ball smelled like. Because when you'd go and open that can, you're like, mm -hmm. oh, it smells so good. And then once that fuzz on the tennis ball would get all sort of gnarly, you're like, you'd, you know, save up money and go get your next new thing of tennis balls yeah. and hope you don't lose them or, you know, get them crushed or whatever. You know, off a new can. Like those are actually things that you can go. Yeah, I legitimately sure. this wine tastes like that smells. Yeah, memory and experience are mm -hmm. critical to your enjoyment of things. Or conversely, mm -hmm. it, it maybe a memory that you don't particularly care for. Yep, that can happen too. Man, I'm really enjoying this cigar. I am too. Yeah, like a lot. Is, it, it's funny because you know we we smoke a lot of nice, fine, high level cigars of of various types and genuses mm -hmm. but sometimes it's just the classics that you're like why don't i smoke more of these mm -hmm. i could just i could smoke one of these any morning i could step right out my back door let the dog do a tinkle and fire one of these things up with my cup of coffee and i would just be i am right as rain i'm legitimately gonna go back to the uh to my local shop and buy more of these this it's like i'm enjoying the heck out of this and i remember if i'm not mistaken my first memory of Ashton cigars, mm. the Robert De Niro movie, Cape Fear, you know, Nick Nolte, mm -hmm. Robert De Niro. He had, you know, what I, what seemed like at the time, you know, massive cigar that he was always smoking on. And if I'm not mistaken, what he was smoking in that movie was Ashton cigars. Really? I think I could be totally wrong, but in my memory, that's what fits. And, okay. and so I always liked Maybe Ashton really true, yeah. and I really like the classic look of this band. It's super simple. It's really clean. It feels very like even the look of this wrapper, kind of the slight shine to it, feels very classically Cuban. Um, sure, it's a great size. Like and the standard protocol white label Ashton is immediately recognizable. Immediately, they have, yeah, a um, great deal of uh, of of history behind that. Yeah, you see that sitting on a table from across the room, you know exactly what you're looking at. Yeah, um, you know a brand that was started in 1985, um, born out of Holt Cigar. <laughs> See if we get that up there. I love it. Um, uh, I have always liked these cigars, but 
you know, there are so many new cigars that come on the market and right. working for a company like Boveda, you get to meet all these really cool cigar producers. And so I want to smoke a lot of this new stuff because I'm always curious about new flavors and new blends and, you know, where, you know, there's some tobacco from Brazil in here or there's tobacco from Peru or I'm always curious about that stuff. But sometimes you forget about these good old standbys. Um, yeah. My brother-in-law loves the Ashton Maduro. So same okay. wrapper, but mm -hmm. the Maduro. Yeah. And I really like the Ashton Maduro in the little bigger ring gauge. Like it just feels very nostalgic to me. Um, and this cigar just tastes amazing. It, it, that's also a great lesson that extends to what we're doing here today uh, with, with pairings. There are, there are new concoctions and old concoctions. You have your your beers that are being produced day to day that are either entirely new styles of beer. Mm -hmm. Same can be said of new cigars. You want to try whatever new cigar just came out, but with a classic vermouth, or do you want to try a classic cigar with uh, a new concoction or do you want to do all classics or all new? There's so much interplay. Yeah. We can, I mean, if this was a, if this was a series in and of itself, for Boveda, where we were doing pairings, you couldn't, you couldn't cross every one of those uh, boundaries to, to mm -hmm. be able to mm -hmm. do an exploration mm -hmm. of of every single pairing. There's yeah. so many. It's yeah. it, it's more about understanding the flavors that you're purporting or hoping to experience and what those flavors are like together. Yeah, and it's pretty rare that you're going to pair something and be angry at it. You're usually going to pull something out of there that you really enjoy. Yeah. So don't worry about being like really specific about how you pair things yeah it's not like che cheese is difficult to pair with wine or beer it's very difficult to pair and you can be wrong yeah but it's pretty hard to be wrong if you got a cigar in one hand and a drink in another yep matt can you throw up uh that last comment there and so this is uh chris 843 i just started smoking in the morning with coffee and it's actually a great experience you sir are now part of the club of the best time of day to have a cigar and i think for the money coffee is the best pairing with cigars it's my favorite yeah it's it's a wonderful experience uh your mileage will vary in terms of that's another thing where okay so pairing coffee and cigars can be a little bit difficult personally if i'm drinking a light roast coffee with a cigar i sometimes get chicken noodle soup out of it it doesn't occur to everybody but it happens to me and i'm like well now i'm just drinking just coffee <laughs> and i'm smoking a cigar but without too much exploration into like you know an ethiopian natural processed coffee with a cigar and they got like a lot of blueberry coming on yes. and then you have a nice dark cigar it's my favorite it's it's a beautiful combination but failing that all the experimentation get an espresso yeah you know? it's it's more fail proof yeah, even yeah. if you can't make a great espresso, espresso at home, go to your your local cafe and get a shot or double shot for three or four bucks, and then take it back home or go sit outside and light a cigar. And odds are you're going to really enjoy that experience. And I think there's nothing better than starting your day with a cigar because that is, I would say maybe we'll say an hour, hour and a half, when you have now started your day with virtually no stress. And if you can, just leave the phone inside. You know, if you want to look at something, grab maybe grab a magazine, grab a book, sit outside. If it's like we just now are starting to get into the cool weather here in Minnesota, September always mm -hmm. tends to be a bit of a psych when it comes to weather in Minnesota because yes. you're looking for fall and that nice crisp weather where you can wear a jacket and it tends to be a little bit warm. But when you get that first cool day, throw on a sweatshirt, grab your cigar, go sit outside. Wow. Clear it's, your mind. It's ethereal it's the best answer your answer your emails and slacks in bed get far ahead enough of them that they think you're you you've been working since five in the morning yep go outside take an hour with a cigar and an yep. espresso say you were in a meeting with yourself yep that'll, that'll be a nice day <laughs> it's the best and, and they can't smoke a cigar a day if he doesn't start at 7 a.m well so. exactly i got i mean yeah. i'm going for george burns type goals here <laughs> yeah. so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that George Burns video. I was like, here's the name, 45 years. Seven different people send me. If you haven't found it uh, on either Instagram or TikTok, uh, George Burns was on the Tonight Show. Yeah. And Johnny Carson says, all right, George, 
what cigar is that for you? He goes, uh, I think this is number 10 or 11. And I tend to smoke 15 to 20 cigars a day. And I'm like, that's my hero. Yeah. That's my guy right there. In his 90s, just... He lived to be 100. Love and life. Yeah. He lived to clip, be 100. In that clip, what was he, 95, 96? Oh, my gosh. Sharp as a tack. Yeah. Absolutely vibrant. Uh, at one point, this is, what, four years ago, five years ago, Cigar Aficionado did a great article on a gentleman named Richard Overton. At the time, the oldest living, for sure the oldest living uh, World War II veteran and the oldest American male. And he smoked 10 to 12 cigars per day from the time he was 19 until he died at 112 years old. Incredible. And I say, God bless him. Because that guy had 10 or 12 moments every day where he had zero stress. He'd get up early, you know, because the older you get, the earlier you get up. Four or five in the morning, little whiskey, he said, in his coffee. And he always smoked machine-made cigars because mm. that's what he liked and he liked the flavor. And he just smoke. I'm like, what? A, it's beautiful. Yeah, how nice is that? Get an air exchange in your kitchen and get mm -hmm. some coffee and a cigar at 5 a.m. Your wife won't wake up and yell at you. Or husband, conversely. Exactly. <laughs> well, we're at about uh, 45 minutes here. Want to encourage you all to click that subscribe button, like our video. Matt will throw those up here, here in a second. Uh, we'd love for you to subscribe to Boba's channel so you can get notified every time we do Unbox Live. We do these every other Friday. And on the other Fridays, we do Box Press podcasts. Uh, predominantly, those are going to be Rob interviewing somebody really cool in the cigar industry. And Rob does a just a phenomenal job of uh, bringing out cool experiences and great stories uh, beyond the actual cigars themselves. Uh, he's just really gifted. Uh, we'd love to have you as a fan, so click that link, uh, that subscribe button, so you can get notified. And again, thanks for joining us on another episode of Unbox Live, Charles. Thanks so much for coming and uh, my pleasure uh, sitting in with me. This has been absolutely a blast. Uh, cheers, you guys, and have a great, uh, great weekend. Happy Friday.